Hello everyone and welcome. In this video, we'll be checking out 9700 variant 2 of May June 2022. This is the walkthrough of paper 1 in the MCQ. Now, before we get started, please make sure to share any resources that you have that you have been studying with lately and you found them to be useful. They will be also useful to the students on this channel if you'd like. Also, if you have any general questions in biology, whether in AS or in A2 or in, you know, biology in general as a whole, please make sure to leave those in the comments and I can help you with those. Now let's get started. Question number one. The photomicrograph shows a bronchial and alveoli. The magnification of the image is 2 times 360. What's the maximum diameter of the bronchial lumen? Now, in order to, to figure out the maximum diameter or the actual diameter, we have to measure the image length. And that's because we know the magnification. And so we're able to use, we're able to use the formula that we know, which is basically, excuse me, which is I, M, A, right? So we have the image length for I, magnification for M, and actual length for A. And that means that you have to divide I image length by actual length to get magnification. However, if you want to get the actual length, you need to divide the image length by the magnification. You'll say we have the magnification, but how will we get the image length? The image length can be, it can, we can get it through measuring the length on this image. However, this ruler is not actually accurate, so I won't be able to measure this length. You, however, can measure the length on your past paper, and yes, there will be some small variations between past papers because of printing issues. However, it will still be such a close answer that you'll be able to recognize the number from A, B, C, or D. So again, you're just going to measure the image length over here, and once you're done measuring that, you're going to divide it by 360 in order to obtain the actual length. Now, because you're going to be measuring in millimeter over here, you'll need to convert the millimeter to micrometer. Remember, centimeter is going to be like the, the, the ruler. Me uh, measuring in it you need to convert this to millimeter by multiplying the centimeter by 10 and then once you're done measuring in millimeter you're going to be multiply basically multiplying by thousand in order to get it into micrometer that's what they want over here okay now remember basically that whenever you are using like you know using a microscopic question or something and, and solving it paper 3 specifically requires you to write down your answer in millimeter the first measurement in millimeter never write it down in centimeter or else you'll be losing grades however once you're done with millimeters you have to convert it into a micrometer if it is required if the number isn't too large and you, poss you can possibly convert it to micrometers to make it clear what the number is then do convert it to micrometer by multiplying by a thousand and that is it now let's move on for question number two a specimen is observed twice with a microscope first using green light with a wavelength of 510 nanometers and then using red light with a wavelength of 650 nanometers what happens to the magnification and resolution when using red light compared to green light okay magnification doesn't change that's because we have no the resolution doesn't have any effect on you know right, the magnification as we mentioned what affects magnification is image length and actual length and that's it when you change the resolution you're not changing any lens you're just changing the quality of the image and when you change the quality of the image let's see how basically resolution is affected by changing the type of the quality the type of light so when you use red light and you use green light you're increasing the, i'm sorry when you use green light and then followed by red light you're actually decreasing uh, I'm sorry, you're actually increasing the wavelength, right? And when you increase the wavelength, you're going to be decreasing resolution because we know that resolution is inversely proportional to wavelength, right? Resolution is inversely proportional to wavelength. This is wavelength and this is R for resolution, okay? And considering they're inversely proportional, that means basically that considering you are using red light now compared to green light and you are increasing the wavelength now compared to green light, that means you're decreasing the resolution, which means it's actually letter C. Now, remember, this is actually, you know, you're going to be like, oh, but resolution equals to half the wavelength, right? And if you say that there's, you know, half of 510 is actually less than half of, you know, uh, half yeah half 510 is less than half of 650 hence basically saying that all oh, resolution is going to increase however increasing the number in resolution actually means decreasing the resolution it is a bit complex however it is a very simple concept once you grasp it so when you say that the resolution is half the number available that doesn't mean that actually resolution is this number for example, in light microscope, the resolution is 200 nanometers. However, in the electron microscope, it is 0.5 nanometers. And we still say that the electron microscope has a much greater resolution compared to the light microscope. And that's because 0.5 nanometers is the maximum, actually, yeah, the minimum distance between two points that can be seen as two separate points. So let's say basically that you have 
two points are 0 0.5 nanometers apart, we'll be able to distinguish these two points under the electron microscope. We'll be able to see that there's a point here and a point here, and it will be very clear. However, when it's 200 nanometers, two points that are 0 0.5 nanometers apart won't be visualized. The maximum distance, I'm sorry, the minimum distance will be 200 nanometers. Beyond that, or smaller than that, it will not be visualized as two separate points instead at, as one point, which will be very blurry, by the way. Okay, so that's why that is C. Number three, four students were asked to match the function with the appearance of some cell structures in an animal cell. The functions were listed by number. Actually, this is a very repeated question, so make sure to, you know, sketch the pattern and how this is solved. One produces the mitotic spindle during cell division. Okay. Production of mitotic spindle is the function of the centrosome, and sometimes here they mention as the central. Synthesis of polypeptides, synthesis of lipids. Okay, polypeptides synthesized by, you know, ribosomes. We can also choose, um, yeah, obviously ribosomes, or often does a reticulum if ribosomes are not available. However, we always know that, you know, ribosomes will be available as non membrane bound spherical structures. So, number two is W. Okay, number one is also a non-membrane bound structure however it is a cylindrical structure so it's y and three senses of lipids actually membrane bound sacs arranged as flattened sacs so flattened sacs is basically the function of this is you know the smooth and vascular reticulum it can also be a rough vascular reticulum but we know that the senses of lipids is the function of the smooth one and so three is letter z or letter v because membranes which are surrounded by an inner closed cavity known as the cisterne Right, and this is also found in, in smooth and vascular reticulum. So you can either choose, a cho I'm sorry, choose C, Z, or V. Okay, so for number one, it has to be Y, and then W, and then V. Correct. Okay, four. What is found in chloroplasts and mitochondria? Both have 70 S ribosomes and circular DNA. That is correct. And neither do the, neither actually have 80 S ribosomes, and both of them have circular DNA. Okay. Which feature is correct for all known viruses? Capsid made of lipid and protein. Actually, this is wrong because capsid is made of protein. DNA core? No, it can be RNA or DNA. It's a nucleic acid core that is common in all viruses. Okay, an outer envelope of phospholipid. Not necessarily this happens when a virus is actually like exits the cell that is, it has infected. Say basically that you have a host cell. The virus has entered it. It's infecting it. It's causing the production of multiple more viruses. Then the now this is with general viral budding. The virus is going to be leaving the cell, not by exocytosis, however, by viral budding. And there's this very small difference, and that's because basically there will be a vesicle forming, and that's going to be outside the cell. As I, as you can see here, when we draw it, you can see that there's a vesicle outside. And that's because the virus is going to bind with its receptors onto the cell surface membrane receptors that are inside the cell, and hence causing. So that's why some viruses are bonded. going to have, you know, some outer envelope of phospholipid. However, some are just going to be bursting out quickly with no outer envelope of phospholipid, and that's why. You know, that's not actually in all viruses. Plus, the first virus to have entered the cell didn't have a phospholipid bilayer out of it, right? Non cellular structure. Non cellular structure, of course, it has is acellular. This is the property we say. It's acellular, meaning it has absolutely no cell organelles, as basically it is a non living or it's a non-living thing, right? So basically, it, is, it doesn't have the cellular structures because it's not, it's not actually a cell, okay? And so it's D. It doesn't have no ribosomes, no nucleus, nothing, okay? Four extracts from different plant materials were made and tested with Bendix solution. The extracts were boiled with Bendix solution for 240 seconds and the final color was recorded. So we have extract one and the color produced is after 240 seconds is red. And then we have yellow, blue, and green. So which sequence of plant extracts represents an increasing quantity of reducing sugars? Now this actually you have to memorize. Okay, with Bendix test, we are testing, as I mentioned, for reducing sugars. And there is a gradual color change to show the degree of concentration of the reducing sugar inside the extract and so basically we start out with blue blue showing there is absolutely no reducing sugar followed by green and then to yellow and you can think of this as basically how oh yeah blue and yellow mixed to give green and so green is in the middle okay and then followed by orange and then red but however considering there's no orange here we're just going to be immediately saying red and it's actually described as brick red and so that's basically the options and so no number three is blue and then green is four and red is one, two is yellow, so it's three, four, two, one, which is option letter D. Which have properties that are dependent on hydrogen bonds? Cellulose and molecular hemoglobin, water. Actually, all of them, water especially, it has... It has a highly dependent structure 
uh, upon hydrogen bonds and you can see that hydrogen bonds here are basically these you know tiny dots or like basically these fragmented lines and that's to show that there are weak bonds it's a weak bond that forms between two molecules any two molecules doesn't necessarily have to be water but in this case because it's water we're gonna have to discuss it using the hydrogen and oxygen atoms so between hydrogen and oxygen there'll be weak forces of attraction that's because there's hot because there's attraction between the partially positive charge on hydrogen and the partially negative or the weak negative charge carried by oxygen and we also call these weak or partially positive charges delta signs so delta positive is basically this letter s sign that you can see so delta positive delta negative now why this forms is because hydrogen has much less protons actually only one proton in its nucleus compared to oxygen which has 16 protons and that means basically that oxygen is capable of attracting much more electrons than hydrogen is and so basically what happens here is that oxygen is going to be attracting all these electrons and so it's going to have this negative sign or partially negative sign and uh, hydrogen is going to have all these pro has it's going to have all these electrons not attracted to it so it's going to have a partially positive sign obviously it's a polar molecule it obviously has hydrogen bonds everywhere cellulose however has hydrogen bonds between you know its microfibers in order to form the cellulose fiber and that's very important in its structure a molecule of hemoglobin does have hydrogen bonds and that's what forms you know the secondary structure the tertiary structure is held by the hydrogen bonds for a molecule of hemoglobin so that's one two and three which statement is correct? Cellulose, glycogen, and immunopectin are all polymers. Okay, that is correct so far. Okay. Ribose, amylase, phospholipids are all micromolecules. Ribose is a monomer, so that's not true. Starch, glucose, and amylose are all monomers. That's false because amylose and starch are polysaccharides or polymers. Sucrose, deoxyribose, and amylopectin are all polysaccharides. No, sucrose is a disaccharide. Deoxyribose is a monosaccharide. However, amylopectin is the only polysaccharide here, so this is the wrong statement. That's why the answer is letter A. The diagram shows two amino acids. Some of the hydrogen atoms are numbered one to six. Okay, what type of hydrogen atoms could contribute to the production of a molecule of water and a peptide bond forms between the two amino acids? Okay, so you have to know the positions of the, you know, the basically the bond formation for a peptide bond. It is actually right over here. Okay, the double bond is never removed. The hydrogen above the nitrogen is never removed. However, basically, the oxygen and hydrogen with the hydrogen are going to be reacting. And so basically, they're going to be forming this molecule of water in a reversible reaction and a peptide bond. Okay, and that's basically how you draw it for this molecule. Okay, it's very important to know how to draw these molecules. Okay, C double bond O and then directly a peptide bond hydrogen. And then the alpha carbon for the other carbon uh, for the other amino acid, obviously, and then double bond, and then O H. I prefer to draw the bonds right here. Okay, and so basically, we can name those again. This is the alpha carbon of the first amino acid, the nitrogen of the amine group, the carbon of the carboxyl group, and then peptide bond nitrogen of the amine groups, carbon alpha carbon, and again the carboxyl group over here. Okay, and that's basically uh, three and four, which is Okay, also one and six. So three and four or one and six, because basically if we put this other side, we are gonna be getting you know the same result. It's gonna be carbon, oxygen, and basically this is gonna be reacting with this in order to form water and a peptide bond in the middle. Okay, it doesn't matter which side, this matters basically that it is like part of the carboxyl and amine groups, okay? Not part of you know this, not are the ones that are found in the R groups, not are the one not the ones that are basically you know below the alpha carbon, not the ones that are you know basically the double bond over here no oxygen involved here obviously okay i hope you got that a student wrote four statements about water water has a high specific heat capacity which means it maintains the temperature of water within cells that is correct mammals rely on ha water having a relatively low latent heat of vaporization to keep them cool actually it's the opposite it has a relatively high latent heat of vaporization hence keeping it as cool when we for example sweat water is going to be taking up lots of energy from our bodies and evaporating with it if it has a low latent heat of vaporization it will take up a smaller portion of energy and evaporate hence not cooling us down however if it's a high latent heat of vaporization it'll take as again a high amount of energy high amount of heat energy and that's why we cool down okay so this is wrong when a negatively charged ion is added to water the positive charge on the hydrogen atom is attracted to the ion 
Okay, so the positive charge on the hydrogen atom is attracted to the ion. I mean, that is actually correct. Okay, when surrounded by water, nonpolar molecules tend to be pushed apart from one another. Actually, no, they're not pushed apart. They actually come closer to each other, right? And form this, like, for example, circular formation. You know, when you see, for example, phospholipids, and we put them, like, basically near a molecule of water, you can see the polar parts are going to be facing the water, and the nonpolar parts are going to be coming to this inside, right? Like, accumulating in one place. They're not pushing apart until that basically they are all staying in this you know hiding place right and so that's number four is wrong okay and that's why number three and one are correct so one three four and two are wrong okay typical enzymes are large globular proteins with a specific tertiary shape which molecular interactions are directly involved in maintaining the tertiary shape okay directly involved are hydrogen bonds obviously disulfide bridges hydrophobic interactions all of them and they forgot to include ionic bonds but that's only because we have three options Okay, which statement about the michaelis benten constant is correct for an enzyme with a low affinity for its substrate? Remember the Km, basically increasing the Km value will decrease the affinity of the enzyme for its substrate and the opposite is also correct. The higher the Km value, the lower, I'm sorry, the lower the Km value, the higher the affinity of the enzyme for its substrate. However, here they say that it's low affinity, meaning basically that it has a high Km. Okay, let's see the options. It has it has a high Km and reaches Vmax at the high substrate concentration. I mean, that is actually correct, considering that if you have a high Km, again, basically, you can have a lower affinity. And when you have a lower affinity, you're going to need a much greater amount, basically, of substrate in order, basically, to reach the maximum rate of reaction. And basically, same, let's look at option B. It has a high Km and reaches Vmax at a low substrate concentration. Actually, uh, no, it's opposite. Now, let me show you the graph of, basically how to explain this thing so we know the normal shape of a graph when there's like you know substrate concentration on the x-axis and then rate of reaction of reaction you know on the y-axis and we can see basically that you know when we have substrate and enzyme on their own you can see that in the beginning there's like this fast reaction going on with a high rate of reaction and then a plateau followed by this plateau is basically when we reach the vmax the maximum rate of the reaction right and then basically, when we add something like a competitive inhibitor, we're going to see this type of shape. Okay, this is with a competitive inhibitor, right? And that's because, as we mentioned, a competitive inhibitor is going to be, you know, basically preventing the substrate from, you know, interacting with the enzyme. It's going to come in between, let's say, or it's actually going to, you know, bind to the enzyme. So that's what's going to happen. This is the enzyme. This is the competitive inhibitor with a similar shape to the substrate. And this over here is the substrate. Okay, the competitive inhibitor is going to come in between of the enzyme and substrate and actually, you know, delay the reaction process. And so decreasing the affinity of the enzyme for its substrate. The affinity is basically described as the attraction, okay? And so basically when, you know, two things are left on their own, they're going to be more attracted to each other and more compelled to speak to each other. However, when you add something in between, they're going to be more distracted by this thing that is in between us now, right? And so this actually decreases the affinity, right? I'm sorry, decreasing the affinity, as in decreasing the attraction, okay, when there's a competitive inhibitor. And we know that decreasing the affinity has something to do with the Km. Let's see what the Km value is. We know the Km value is the substrate concentration at which half the Vmax is reached. And so this is, let's say, half of the Vmax in the initial reaction, okay, the same Vmax will be reached when there is a competitive inhibitor at the end, though, okay, after such using a, such a high substrate concentration, right? Okay, we can see that the Km value here, substrate concentration here, is actually very low, okay? It's the Km value here is low. However, when you put a competitive inhibitor, you increase the Km value, showing that when you increase the Km value, the affinity decreases. When you decrease the Km value, the affinity increases, and that's where, where they came up with this idea of all Km has to do with the affinity okay and then basically you can see that obviously when you increase the km value decrease the km I'm sorry yeah do increase the km value you're going to see that you need such a higher substrate concentration to reach the vmax which is what is stated right over here oh my god <laughs> okay excuse me that's not right i hope this was clear if it wasn't please make sure to let me down, know down in the comments and i can possibly make it clear okay 
So long chain saturated fatty acids change from solid to liquid at a high temperature as compared with short chain unsaturated fatty acids. Which fatty acids would be more likely to form triglycerides in mammals that live in cold climates? Okay, living in cold climates, they basically we know that unsat we're gonna have much more unsaturated fatty acids compared to you know um, saturated fatty acids because basically we're trying to you know make it slightly less rigid the basically phospholipid bilayer because in cold climates they're going to be you know not moving it's going to be much less fluid environment and to increase fluidity we need more unsaturated fatty acids are actually short and so it's short chain unsaturated when animal cells are cultured a salt solution is added to keep the cells alive what's the purpose of a salt solution okay the salt solution is going to prevent let's see the options to allow facilitated diffusion of salt into the cells that's not the point to prevent diffusion of other ions in or out of the cells to prevent net movement of water into or out of the cells exactly okay so we do not want the cells to burst we are we're culturing them we want them to grow we want them to thrive if you add let's say water instead of a salt solution or just do not add a salt solution and you just let them grow in this medium where there's no water obviously we're not going to have any growth because we need water however if you just add water you're going to have you know basically them bursting because okay they're going to be getting up all this water by osmosis this is the animal cell and water is just coming in by osmosis and this kid just keeps coming in until the point where like you know it bursts okay and that's what happens when you have lots of water and so we instead add a salt solution right and so basically salt solution let's say with the same concentration of salts in and out or let's say a water potential inside and outside the cell and that means basically there's no net movement of water the same amount of water moves in and moves out of the cells keeping it the same size preventing it from bursting okay to, rent a source, to provide a source of energy for active transport actually salts have no in, like involvement in this we know that the source of energy for active transport is sugars which are in you know, involved in respiration we don't have salts involved in respiration okay the following are all processes that allow movement into cells so we have phagocytosis active transport and facet diffusion which processes require atp we have obviously active transport and facet and uh, phagocytosis however not facet diffusion from its name diffusion is a passive process it does not require energy it does not require atp okay and so one and two only which is letter a which features are required to allow for efficient diffusion a large surface area a short diffusion pathway and maintenance of a constant diffusion gradient okay for efficient diffusion obviously we need to maintain a constant diffusion gradient and basically a short diffusion pathway and a large surface area all of them one two and three right because we know that diffusion is the movement of substances from region of higher concentration to lower concentration down a concentration gradient and basically it's you know like wherever whenever and it's like living non-living things right however if you increase the surface area if you increase the you know space to which they can move they're going to be moving faster the molecules will have much more space to move and they won't basically wait in line for another molecule to move because they can just immediately move right here right and same thing basically when you have a short diffusion pathway instead of like them taking forever to reach the place they need to be they're actually going to be right in there immediately however if you like say that oh we need to travel all of this it's going to be much you know less efficient and maintenance of constant diffusion gradient if you do not maintain the constant diffusion gradient the molecules are going to be moving at such a fast rate until basically we have, you know, like, you know, we have the same amount of molecules inside and outside, right? And that's basically when the diffusion rate is going to be going to be declining, right? Like at this point, okay, the rate of movement is going to be much shorter considering you do not need it. And, you know, we do not have such a steep concentration difference, okay? And that's why basically, you know, the efficient diffusion will be it's much less efficient, okay? And that's why we need to maintain a constant diffusion gradient. What's our role of mitosis? Growth of organisms. Okay, mitosis, growth of organisms, production of genetically different cells, repair of cells, replacement of cancerous tissue. That is wrong, that is wrong, that is wrong. It's actually true. Right? So why is it not replacement of cancerous tissue? Because, you know, we're not, why do we need to replace the cancerous tissue? It's not like it's actually a, you know, injured tissue, okay? And it's not like basically we can, you know, just replace it. It's a cancerous tissue is just there and you cannot just to get rid of it and replace it now, okay? You have to remove it first surgically and then basically we do not need to replace it actually something that was in excess in our body and that we do not need, okay? We do not need to replace it actually. Telomeres prevent the loss of genes from the ends of chromosomes during DNA replication, but they become shorter each time they are copied. Okay, in cancer cells and stem cells, the telomeres remain the same length. What is st which statement is correct for all human cells? If telomeres become too short, a cell may stop dividing. Okay, adding telomeres could increase the rate of aging of cells. 
adding telomeres would not increase the rate of aging, in fact, it will decrease the rate of aging. Telomeres are repaired by the enzyme RNA polymerase. Actually, they're repaired by the enzyme telomerase. Telomerase prevent all damage occurring to DNA molecules. Not all damage, because there's damage that happens due to mutations and mutagens and so on, and that has nothing to do with telomeres, and so that's letter A. The nucleus of a mouse body cell in G1 phase of cell cycle has 1.2 times 10 to the power of 12 minus 12 grams of DNA. What would happen to the mass of DNA in the nucleus of the cell at the end of S phase and at the end of G2 phase of the cell cycle? Now, if you know what happens in the cell cycle, we know that during the S phase, there will be synthesis, right? It's, it's, it's S for synthesis phase. It's actually when there will be DNA replication. And when there's DNA replication, the mass of the DNA is going to double. And that's going to remain the same all the way until cytokine kinesis which is the end of the mitotic cell cycle g2 phase comes before cytokinesis and same thing with mitosis it comes before cytokinesis and so all throughout the mito mitosis and g2 and s phase we have actually double this amount of dna it's 2.4 times 10 to the power of minus 12 grams and that's also the same thing for g2 so that's letter d what occurs during prophase in animal cells? Fragmentation of the nuclear envelope, the nucleolus disappear, stained chromosomes become visible, centrioles replicate. Okay, they're all correct except for number four. Number four is not correct because centrioles actually replicate during G2 phase, and then centrioles are going to be moving, or centrosomes, you know, as, like centrioles as part of centrosomes will be moving towards the opposite poles of the spindle, or basically the opposite sides of the cell. Okay, that's during prophase. The movement and the migration happens during prophase, but the replication itself happens during G2 phase, the second growth period. So it's one, two, and three, which is letter B. Okay, which statement describes the structure of ATP? So first you have to know that it's an RNA nucleotide and basically it's an RNA nucleotide because it has the ribose sugar and it has basically oxygens at carbon number two and carbon number three. However, basically it is uh, it has two extra phosphates to the RNA nucleotide. This is a mistake that much that a lot of people make. They're basically saying that they have three extra phosphates and actually yes, it does have three phosphate groups. However, they are only two extra because already in the RNA nucleotide we have one phosphate group. And so when basically we're talking about our ATP, we know it has three phosphate groups, meaning it has two extra phosphates. Let's go ahead and draw this. Here's a diagram for you to memorize if you'd like. Lampicin is an antibiotic used to treat tuberculosis. It works by inhibiting RNA polymerase in bacteria, which processes are directly inhibited by this antibiotic. Okay, let's see. RNA polymerase is actually responsible for transcription. And so DNA replication has nothing to do with it because DNA replication is going to be happening by DNA polymerase, and so that's not, not inhibited directly. Enzyme synthesis, yes, because transcription will stop, hence, you know, there will be no enzyme synthesis because enzyme is a protein, and proteins are synthesized by transcription, followed by translation, and when there is no transcription, there is no translation. ACP synthesis, no, that's right, actually, it will be indirectly affected because, you know, transcription, translation will stop, okay, and that means production of proteins inside mitochondria will stop, okay, and that's why number two only is D. The table shows the DNA triplet codes for some amino acids. Amino acid, we have arginine, DNA triplet code CGA. Okay, let's look at the base sequence over here. So we have, here we have, you know, the, the dictionary, and we can see the base sequence of the, the template DNA strand coding for part of the polypeptide is shown. And basically, this is the, on the template strand, okay? Uh, two mutations occur in the sequence during DNA application, which means the template DNA strand will result in a shorter polypeptide chain. Okay, shorter polypeptide chain meaning basically we're going to have a stop code on, okay? And so a stop, and this is a DNA triplet code, and a DNA triplet code again over here. Okay, and stop that basically is for ATC. Let's see, let's see. So a shorter polypeptide chain, let's see if CCA, same thing, and then ACA, what does ACA stand for? Now we know stop is actually ATC, so we're going to be looking out for this. However, ACA, okay, um, yeah, there are two mutations, by the way. Okay, so ACA over here is cysteine. That doesn't change, it actually doesn't do anything okay and then here we also have tta ttc gta okay we're just looking for the one with an atc right here shorter chain. it's c 
Some of the features present in transport tissues are listed, which features are present in the xylem vessel elements, lignified cell walls, yes, no cytoplasm, no mitochondria, pits, no plasmodesmata, and that's why it's one and four only. Remember that like xylem vessel elements and xylem vessels are actually dead, you know, are actually dead, and so they don't have any organelles to them, they do not have any, you know, living components, it's only the cell wall, the lignified walls, and obviously the pits, okay? The diagram shows the transfer sections through parts of a plant, which row is correct. Okay, so we have to, you know, choose what contains lignin, which is a xylem, and what transports organic solute, which is the phloem. And we know that the phloem is to the outside always, and so it's 2, 3, and 5. Okay, 2, 3, and 5, and then 1, 4, and 6 would be B for xylem. Okay, which of the molecules form, form hydrogen bonds with water during transcription? Okay. Forming hydrogen bonds with water during transcription, cellulose in the, z in the xylem wall. Okay, yes. Dur I'm sorry, during transpiration. <laughs> cellulose in the, in the xylem wall. Okay, suberin in the xylem wall, obviously not. Other mol water molecules in the xylem. Of course, during co with the cohesion thing, you know. 1 and 3, C. Some plant species can take up heavy metal contaminants, contaminants that are dissolved in soil water and then transport them within the plants. The within plant cells, the heavy metal ions accumulate mainly in the vacuum. What suggestions about the transport and accumulation of heavy metals are, are valid? After the initial entry into the root, some of the heavy metals can pass through the tomoclast to be stored in the vacuum of cells in the cortex. Obviously, otherwise, how can they be stored in the vacuum? Uh, the heavy metals take an aplastic pathway through in the xylem, but at the, at the endodermis must take a symplastic pathway. Obviously, because at the endodermis we have suberine, and suberine is hydrophobic component, or let's say, you know, basically... It is waterproof and repels water. It's a waxy chemical. The rate of accumulation of heavy metals in the leaf cells will be faster at night when photosynthesis is not occurring and during the day. Okay. And this is um, not a valid, uh, basically, suggestion because, like, why would it be faster at night? Why would, like, uh, why would it not be the same rate at night and at day considering it has nothing to do with photosynthesis? The presence of heavy metals causes the transpiration stream to slow down and reduce the rate of transpiration. Really, it won't affect the rate of transpiration and transpiration stream will not slow down because transpiration stream's rate of flow depends on transpiration pull, which is dependent upon, you know, the difference in hydrostatic pressure gradient across the stem and that's basic or basically, you know, from the stem to the leaf. So what's the correct route for the movement of water from cell to cell in a plast pathway through adjacent cell surface membranes, through intercellular spaces, through plasmodesmata, through the Casparian strip? It doesn't move through the Casparian strip because it can't. Plasmodesmata is part of the simplast, not a plast pathway. Intercellular spaces are correct, however, adjacent cell membranes, again, it's wrong. What's the aplast pathway? Aplast pathway is the dead pathway. Okay, it has nothing to do with cell membranes or plasmodesmata or the cytoplasm. Okay, these are living components of the cells. However, it has to do with the cell wall, that component. It has to do with the intercellular spaces that are not actually part of the cell. That's letter, letter B. Which row shows the correct sequence for the movement of sucrose into a phloem, into phloem sieve tubes? First, diffusion of sucrose into the companion cell cytoplasm. Okay, actually, no. It's the, let's start with active transport of protons into the companion cell cytoplasm. Actually, it's out of the companion cell cytoplasm, correct. And then co-transport of protons and sucrose into the companion cell cytoplasm. And then the diffusion of sucrose into the sieve tubes, that is correct. Okay, what occurs during ventricular systole in a mammalian heart? Ventricular systole, water pressure is going to increase arterial pressure does not change ventricular pressure increases obviously ventricular pressure increases however arterial pressure is going to decrease aortic pressure is going to increase well during ventricular systole aortic pressure does not increase until the end and so that is not actually part of ventricular systole it's letter d so what plan which plant diagram represents the tissues in the major vein actually no it's letter v one and three only because we know that the graph shows basically if you ever drew the graph of like the arteries and, and ventricles and, and everything you can see actually that the pressure inside the arteries is going to increase during ventricular systole okay and that's letter a that's letter b okay 31 which plant diagram presents the tissues in a major vein okay in a major, major vein we have three layers like the arteries however we have a wide lumen and very thin tissues okay and that's letter d the diagram shows the pressure changes in the various structures of the left side of the heart during the cardiac cycle. And this is the graph that I was talking about. At the end of which period is the ventricle, ventricle full of blood. Okay, the ventricle is going to be full of blood when, you know, basically left atrium is going to be pumping out 
or let's say the atria are actually going to be pumping the blood into the ventricles right and that's basically from let's actually at point a because here we have ventricular systole and during ventricular systole we can see that the left ventricle is these dots right and you can see that there's such an increase here in pressure right and that's basically when ventricular systole happens however basically before that this is atria systole when there's a decrease in the pressure okay and that's basically normal Okay, which description of movement of substances during interstitial fluid formation is correct? So we have low hydrostatic pressure forces of substances out of the capillary at the arterial end, for, uh, allowing some substances to enter the fluid that baths the cell. There's actually a very high hydrostatic pressure inside the arterial end of the capillary, and that's because we go from the big artery, artery with such high, amazing amounts of pressure to the artery, art, arteriole, which is basically a, t a tiny space, so obviously it's gonna have really high pressure. There's not as much as the artery, yet basically you cannot say there's low hydrostatic pressure. You can never say that about the arterial end, only about the venular end, and that's why letter A is wrong. Tissue fluid moves back into the venule due to a net hydrostatic pressure change in the capillary. Net hydrostatic pressure change is really not clear. And so we cannot really say that and doesn't really move back to the venule, it moves back to the venule end of the capillary. So that's two things wrong about this statement. Movement of water in a tissue fluid into the capillary by osmosis is due to the low water potential and low hydrostatic pressure inside the capillary. Exactly. Okay, movement of substances back into the capillary, back uh, out of the tissue fluid and into the capillary is due to by osmosis because of the low water potential inside, because of the low hydrostatic pressure inside. And so it's going to move from region of high water potential, high water hydrostatic pressure, and into the region of lower water potential, lower hydrostatic pressure, down a water potential gradient, and down a hydrostatic pressure gradient by osmosis across a partially permeable membrane. And that is true. Okay. A high, a high water potential of the surrounding tissue fluid causes substances to leave the capillary is at the arterial end. Okay, so if this was true, then basically substances would actually have a struggle leaving the capillary because there's a high water potential outside, meaning that there will be a higher you know, amount of substances outside. So how will substances move? What with what will they move suppose that we are supposed to be moving with water right so there's a high hydrostatic pressure inside the capillaries at the arterial ends and so it's going to be pushing the substances out with it right it's going to be you know the water is going to be carrying the small substances out of the capillaries with it right through the holes however now if we're saying that it's the opposite that means risky substances will be moving back into the capillaries at the arterial end instead of out and that doesn't make sense because then the entire circulation would be like in you know, different opposite directions. Okay, and that's that's it for question number thirty-three. It's letter C, obviously. It shows the change in the concentration of some substances. Sorry. Okay, some substances in the red blood cells when the carbon dioxide diffuses from active cells. Okay, for carbonic anhydrase, the concentration has obviously no change. Okay, hydrogen ion concentration, however, it does increase. Okay, and hydrogen ions does increase. Okay, so it's letter D system as iron the gas exchange system are listed we have the alveolus alveolus epithelium ciliated cell goblet cell and smooth muscle cell the ticks check in the table shows specialized features of three of these cell type the types of cells okay many mitochondria loss of endovascular reticulum many golgi bodies which row correctly matches the specialized feature with the correct cell obviously many golgi bodies found in goblet cells so that's letter l uh, however many mitochondria can be found in ciliated epithelial cell i'm sorry ciliated cell alveolus epithelium cell not so sure obviously we have smooth muscle cell true okay so it could be m okay m or uh well k okay and however many mitochondria also could be found in j so it's j m and then l for example or we can see k and then j no i think it's k and then m and then l correct okay it's c why is it so difficult to control the spread of tuberculosis? Global air travel for commerce and tourism has increased. The bacteria that causes tuberculosis has evolved resistance to some antibiotics. True. The bacteria that causes tuberculosis shows great antigenic variability. Civil unrest and poverty result in overcrowded living conditions, obviously. Okay, and so we're looking at two and one, two, and four. Okay, because when you travel out, you can spread tuberculosis, yes. Okay. Rabies is a viral disease which can be spread to humans through a bite from an infected animal. One method of treatment is to inject the patient with antibodies specific to the rabies virus. What statements about this treatment are correct? The patient will have the patient will have a natural passive immunity to rabies. Actually, it's active, uh, artificial, not. Mm, I'm sorry, it's artificial, not natural. Okay, sorry about the passive thing. Okay, artificial. Okay. The injected antibodies will be broken down by the patient. 
and check out the bodies actually yes eventually they'll be broken down by the patients because they are foreign bodies okay uh, the patient memory cells will be able to produce the antibody more rapidly in the future actually no because this is passive immunity and what passive immunity means is actually there'll be no response in the future but they like there no quick response okay it's not going to be like you know we're going to have a secondary immune response it's actually it's going to be the first and um, the primary immune response not the secondary one okay the immunity provided will only last for a short time obviously this is what passive immunity is it's going to only last for a short time it's only to protect let's say babies against something that they cannot fight right now because their immune system is very weak or basically something to protect someone with with a very dangerous disease like rabies okay from like for example in rabies case we cannot wait for the person to you know have a primary immune response and we cannot wait for this person's uh, lymphocytes to recognize this basically pathogen and by its antigens and everything and basically start production of antibodies and then antibodies to fight them because we do not have time this has to be fought quickly otherwise that person is going to die so it's two and four only which is letter d a person's blood group is determined by the antigens present on the red blood cells the table shows antigens and antibodies in the blood of people with different blood groups during a blood transfusion it's essential that the person who receives the blood does not have the antibodies to the donor's blood which blood groups can be given to a person with blood group b so i obviously know this answer because i memorized the table i do not need to look back at the table i do suggest that you look at it if you can understand it but if you are very confused by this table you have to memorize what who, which person can give and which person cannot okay and so blood group b can be given blood from blood groups b and o only okay and i'm gonna write it down for you okay for so basically let's just look at the table and then i'm gonna post the table for blood groups that you have to memorize and i'm also going to be posting it on the community if you want to refer to it later on okay so which blood groups can be given to a person blood group b so let's look at the options blood group and here we can see b presence of b, or b antigens on the red blood cells so it only has b antigens however the presence of antibodies has anti-a so it cannot be given any blood group that has a antigens on it okay so it cannot be given a because it's a b because it has a antigens and it cannot be given a because it has a antigens again and that's why basically it has to be b or o because o doesn't have a antigens so it cannot will not be attacked by the anti-a antibodies and that's why as you can see, a plus sign can take blood from any type of blood. However, if there is a minus sign, it can only receive from the minuses. And don't forget that AB can receive from all types of blood. However, o, uh, basically, O can only receive from O. And that A can only receive from A or O. Same thing for B. It's from B or O. It's lesser B. Lesser D, I'm sorry. A student used a diagram to show four types of cells involved in the primary immune response. Okay, which row is correct? Cell type 4. Recognize it. Let's start with cell type 1. Where it is chemicals that stimulate phagocytosis to engulf phagocytes to engulf antigens. Okay, so we have either B lymphocyte, macrophage, T helper cell, or T killer cell. Obviously, it's T helper cell because it's going to be secreting these. Cytokines. Okay, cell 2. Uh, destroys cells infected with viruses which would be released into the body. So, destroying the cells infected with viruses which we release into the body that's obviously the function of t-killer cells or we can also say yeah t-killer cells obviously okay and cell 3 b and lc produces the antibodies required to bind antigens yes b lymphocytes and recognizes the foreign antigen moves towards it and surrounds it this is obviously the macrophage how does it recognize the foreign antigen because it has it's an antigen presenting cell right and so it's an antigen presenting cell that is going to recognize the foreign antigen because basically it's you know it has its ways like it's basically going to be attacked to it by chemicals however basically it's going to surround it and engulf it by phagocytosis and that's why we call it a macrophage okay and that's why it's a phagocyte okay this was it for this variant i hope this video was useful and please make sure to you know write down as i mentioned any comments of any questions that you have and you want them to be made clear and thank you guys for watching goodbye